So, because you guys seems, seemed a lot confused with these concepts today, let's see if I can review that on a more clear way for you guys. So let's consider this phylogenetic tree right here. You can see we're going to be talking about uh, the traits that define this phylogenetic tree. So the trait here in question is color. The ancestral state of these traits in this phylogenetic tree is gray. And then some organism can show up that in different colors or just maintain that um, gray color. So based on that, you can define a concept known as apomorphy, which is the derived tra trait evolved within a tree. This, another way to say that, that this is a novelty. The ancestral state of color was gray. And at some point, somebody shows up with a different color. In that case, in that case here, the color is black. If, uh, not if, another uh, way you can call a trait is say that this is the ancestral state of a trait. In that case, plesio, which means old, plesiomorphic, a node morphology for that trait. And for this tree here in question, that ancestral state is gray, and gray is a simple, simple uh, uh, plesiomorphy. Now, if for if you know that an apomorphy is shared, a novelty is shared with a common ancestor, then you say that this is a synapomorphy. But beware that this shared trait has to be between two or more taxa. You could have like a third one here if you wanted to. And their most recent ancestor. So in a way, you can say that a synapomorphy, it's a apomorphy that was shared between two or more taxa and their ancestor. And that is the reason why these terms are relative to each other. You have to define the grouping, the taxa that you're talking about, before you can uh, understand if that trait is a novelty, or if it's an ancestor state, or if it's a novelty that is shared with an ancestor. So what is very interesting, though, about this is that you're going to be able to use synapomorphies to group organisms. And you're going to group them in a lump of organisms that share a common ancestor. This group of organisms that share a common ancestor is going to be called a monophyletic group. The entire tree is monophyletic here. For that matter, all trees will be monophyletic. But you can actually say get like everybody that has this synapomorphy that is black color and their ancestor and say, hey, this is a monophyletic group. And you can call that. You can call that anything you want to. If that was a memo, you would be able to say, hey, everybody that has mammary glands, I'm going to call them memos. And you're going to use the synapomorphies to group that. You do that. You know that this concept is pretty much built in with you at this point, and you use that to classify organisms. Let's see an example of that. So here, it's a phylogeny showing you the kingdoms. So you're going to have the plant kingdom, the animal kingdom, and all the kingdoms here. So let's get a trait here. Let's get presence of a nuclear envelope. That is my trait that I'm going to analyze it. You know that the organisms that do not, the most primitive organisms, do not have a nuclear envelope. They are therefore called the prokaryotic organisms. At some point along the evolution of these prokaryotes, an organism showed up with a nuclear envelope. And when, once that happened, you actually became a eukaryotic organism. So the evolution of a nuclear envelope was a novelty, an apomorphy that allows you to group organisms that now based on do they have an ancestor that has a nuclear envelope or they do not have an ancestor that do not have a nuclear envelope. So 
a synapomorphy for the protist group is that all their ancestors have a nuclear envelope. But before that, you did not have a nuclear envelope. A novelty showed up, an apomorphy showed up, and now this apomorphy is shared with the entire group. We did that like for, we saw that when we were talking about other organisms. We can talk about the hyphae, that is a structure that is just found on fungi, and it can be a synapomorphy for the fungi. We can think of traits for animals or plants that are unique to them, and then all their ancestors will all, everything that is known as plant is derived from an organism that share those traits. You group those organisms based on this evolutionary relationship that they have. But a trait could be anything. It does not have to be a, an organelle as the nucleus. It could be anything that is recognizable by the taxonomist, the person that is studying these relationships, or the cladistic that is actually establishing the evolutionary relationships between them. So it could be something as simple as symmetry. You can have radial symmetry, and that refer to the organism that look like a pie, and you can divide them in multiple planes, and each one of these planes corresponds to a symmetric half of that, a symmetric part of that organism. Everything that is on this plane here, in this slice of my pie here, will be present on the other one. Everything that is in that slice here on the top is going to be present on the other one. Or you can be uh, bilateral symmetry. Everything that is one half is going to be in just another half, not multiple ones. So this is a trait that can be used to classify organisms. Let's see if you can see an example of that. So let's consider the following phylogenetic tree. You can see here the relationship among um, all the eutometazoa, another way to say animals. So the ancestor of animals is a protist. At some point along the way, a trait evolved, and that trait was multicellularity. So, meaning multiple cells. An apomorphy showed up, and then now all animals share a common trait with their ancestor, and that trait is having multiple cells. Now, go, going back to what we we're talking about symmetry. You're going to be able to separate these animals based on the ones that have radial symmetry, that can be divided as a pie, and the ones that do not have radial symmetry. Another trait that is shown in this picture here is the number of germ layers or embryological layers. You're going to have the organisms that have radial symmetry, they are diploblastic, meaning that they have just ectoderm and endoderm, while these guys on this side here who have three layers. They're going to be ectoderm, mesoderm, and endoderm. Another trait that shows up, presence of a coelom, organisms that do not have a coelom, and organisms that can have their body cavity not completely lined by the mesoderm, they are called a pseudocelomate organisms, or the organisms that have their body cavity completely lined by mesoderm. So, of course, some of these can be a little bit um, difficult for you guys to see because you're not familiar with the trait itself. You didn't know what a coelomate organism was, what a coelom is, but a taxonomist is able to actually identify the, the trait and also the states of that trait. And this way, he can start to to establish evolutionary relationships among organisms. With these traits that I'm showing here, it's easy to see big divisions, big groups of organisms, the ones that have radial symmetry and the ones that do not have radial symmetry, that have bilateral symmetry. But what allows one to actually get the fine um, distinction of that tree, distinguish why one organism will belong to the phylum to the phylum known as Cnidaria, and why another organism will be present in another phylum. And again, it would be apomorphies, novelties that separate that group that make that group unique. Let's consider a phylum here, the phylum Porifera, that in which you find all the sea sponges. 
Periphera, one of the cinepomorphies of the entire group, novelties that show up there, it's this structure known as coanocyte. A coanocyte, it's a, it's a special type of cell that has a flagellum, and that whipping of that flagellum circulates water in a way that this sponge can actually absorb food. So sponges are filter feeders because they get the particles that are present in seawater, whip that with the flagellum, and then the current created by these guys allow the sponges to feed through phagocytosis um, in those particles. Another characteristic uh, trait of periphery of sponges is the presence of spicules. They create the structure that supports the sponge. Um, if you are a biologist and you are enthusiastic about classification of organisms, there is this very interesting website that, that I like a lot. And this website is called the Tree of Life. It's a project that it tries to classify um, all diversity on Earth. So I'm going to type here periphery. I already typed here periphery. And let's see what it shows me. So we click on periphery here. And you see that periphery group is going to have like sub-segmentations as well. You're going to have the calcari spongy, the excess tenili, the spongy, and the demo spongy group. Those correspond to classes of organisms. Again, classification of organisms is hierarchical. So you move from phylum to class, and each time you move on, you are moving to um, a more restricted group of organisms that are all related with each other. So you can click on the calcaria one, for instance. And this group specifically, all the spicules that are present in this group, they are calcareous spicules. There's a lot of calcium in the deposit of them, and that's how you group that. The type of spicule here was used as a synapomorphy to classify all the calcareous sponges into a monophyletic group. So going back to our phylogeny, you can now understand the groupings of these organisms. And the take-home message for the class is you group organisms based on synapomorphies, traits that are shared their common ancestor. And with that, you are able to create groups that are monophyletic, that come from a common ancestor. A good example of that could be the jellyfish. There are two groups of jellyfish. There are one is known as Daria, the other one is known as Knophora, and they all come from a common ancestor, and you're going to have specific traits that will put them, distinguish them apart. But that's how you would develop a phylogenetic tree like this one. That's it. I hope that clarified things. Thank you.